Hello, I'm Henry Coy, and we're here at Taylor English Duma in Atlanta doing Quillian's Kernels. Uh, we are picking up where we left off last month, and uh, for those of you that are watching this on video, this is a series. It's about the 12th video of the series. Our goal is to uh, increase the best practices within our firm and to help mentor people that are not in the firm learn about uh, litigation under the Georgia Civil Practice Act and under the Uniform Superior Court Rules. I have uh, about 25 colleagues here uh, who have ranging uh, various ranges of experience. We have a tremendous amount of litigation experience in the room, and I do call on my colleagues uh, for comments, suggestions, debate, etc. So listen carefully to what they say. I'm principally just a leader. Please remember that uh, Taylor English is not providing legal advice. We are providing guidance for lawyers who are lawfully uh, authorized to practice law to do their own investigation into what the rules are and how they ought to handle their clients' matters. But this is similar to a uh, continuing legal education where you can uh, use it as a reference point. Now, uh, last time, for these, those of you that weren't here and those that you were here, you may recall that we started right after summary judgment was denied, and so we had an inevitable trial, perhaps with definitely with claims, perhaps with counterclaims, and we talked about the numerous things that you need to do to work your case towards trial, uh, starting with things like getting in touch with your witnesses, making sure you sugar them up for potential uh, presentation and appearance at trial, starting to organize your documents so that you can ultimately uh, use them at trial and put them into the pretrial order, uh, looking at your claims, honing out the ones that aren't any good anymore or that you think will be a waste of the jury's time, may ultimately lose them, uh, making sure you have the evidence to support the ones that, that you will be taking to trial, and same thing with the defenses. Uh, at the very end of that uh, tape, we discussed the issue of whether you need to show up at trial with evidence to prove that the venue is proper over the defendant. And we ended up in an unresolved debate over whether, under the circumstances where you have raised improper venue in your answer, whether well, where the defendant has raised improper venue in the answer, whether or not uh, that defense can be waived uh, during the course of litigation by, for instance, going through discovery, filing motions for summary judgment, et cetera. And uh, Mr. Munger, who is not present today, uh, but, but did provide us with a very recent case citation uh, that helps resolve that issue. The case is Brooks versus R.E.S. Georgia A.L.B.C. L.L.C. How do you like that sexy name? Uh, 317 Georgia Appeals 264-212. And uh, first of all, it cites Rule 12D, referring to preliminary hearings, and it says the defense is specifically enumerated in paragraphs one through seven of subsection B of this code section, whether made in a pleading or by motion, and the motion for judgment mentioned in subsection C of this code section shall be heard and determined before trial on application of any party unless the court orders that the hearing or determination thereof shall be deferred until trial. And then the case itself, referring to the issue of whether a waiver can take place when it an answer does raise the defense of um, improper venue says under the Civil Practice Act a venue defense shall be asserted quote in the response of pleading thereto if one is required or by motion or in, ri in writing that's rule 12b want of venue however may be waived expressly by failing to raise it in, the, in an answer or by written motion or impliedly by failing to elicit a ruling from the trial court on the question of venue before the entry of judgment or the commencement of trial. So, it would appear to me, and the, the Brooks case was a summary judgment case, it appears to me that if, if you allow summary judgment to be entered against your client before you expressly, by motion, cause the court to rule on the improper venue issue, then it can be waived. And then further, if you, quote, commence the trial, uh, without uh, that issue being resolved. So, uh, nevertheless, if I was the plaintiff, I would want to show up with evidence 
that venue is proper and go ahead and get it into evidence during the case because, uh, or at least have it available for a pretrial motion in the event uh, the defendant comes in at trial and moves to, to dismiss for lack of venue, if you don't have any evidence, you might be out of luck if you're the plaintiff. So I think that answers that issue. There's not a case where, I'm, to the best of my knowledge, where there was an appeal because the uh, plaintiff allowed the case to start, the defendant allowed the case to start without ever raising that issue and the plaintiff didn't prove up venue and then tried to appeal for, uh, the defendant tried to appeal because of lack of venue. So, but that's the best law we have on that. Now today, we are going to uh, discuss preparation of pretrial orders. And uh, as I mentioned to some of you, we have a special arrow in our quiver this month that we've not had in the past. And this is former Superior Court Judge Michael Johnson of the Fulton County Superior Court. He is over here to my right. And uh, certainly along the way, I'll be asking him to ask, to answer. So what does a judge do in this situation? Or what does a judge think about that? Well, he can't think of, he obviously can't answer for every judge. He can just uh, talk about what he might do under certain circumstances. And there, there is discretion in the preparation of these pretrial orders. And I think some would say you ought to maybe put in there as much as you have to, but as little as you have to, uh, because uh, you don't want to give up your entire uh, case, your entire uh, trial, inadvertently by putting everything down in the pretrial order that would give any, uh, any clue to everything that you're going to do in trial to the other side. So where do these rules uh, reside? Uh, they might know what rule of the Civil Practice Act drives pretrial orders. Well, it's Rule 16, 91116, and uh, that authorizes the court upon the motion of a party to call a pretrial conference at which the judge can do this, that, and the other as requested by the party. So in the first instance, if the court doesn't on its own order a pretrial conference, a party can ask for one. Uh, and uh, under 911.16, the issues that are proper for this conference include the simplification of issues, the necessity or desirability of amendments to the pleadings, which we talked about last time about how you could amend your pleadings in the context of a pretrial order. Uh, you could also probably end up at the conference with a preclusion from amending your pleadings uh, as a result of that conference. The possibility of obtaining admissions of fact, admissions of fact or end of documents with, to avoid the necessity of proof. In other words, can you get stipulations with respect to the documents or the facts? Uh, the limitation of the number of expert witnesses and such other matters as may aid the disposition of the action. Who does that place discretion in? The judge. The judge, yes. Uh, and also you can come up with ideas that would aid in the disposition of the action. And then 911.16b uh, b um, goes through a uh, litany of things that the court should take into account. Talks about uh, preclusion that can take place by, as a result of agreements between counsel. In other words, once you agree to it in this pretrial conference, you might not be able to get back on your, you know, turn back on your agreements. The judge may make you uh, stick with what you agreed to unless uh, the judge sees this manifest injustice is going to occur because of some agreement. Maybe there was no knowledge of a party that a certain witness was going to come in and testify a certain way. And it also talks about uh, what happens if additional expert witnesses are brought forward to testify what the rights of the parties are uh, in the event, the opposing party is in the event a new expert is brought in. Does anybody know what the right of an opposing party is if the other side brings in a new expert? Do they want to testify at trial, never been disclosed and in in, uh, discovered? You have to depose them or you get to depose them? Okay, yeah, you, you have the right to depose the expert. And of course, how much, how much preparation time are you going to have to do that deposition? A day. 
Well, not, maybe not even a day. What do you? How much time do you give a, a, well, a, a lawyer to depose a new expert witness? It, it depends on, in many instances, in many instances, the complexity of the case uh, and whether or not there was any knowledge that this new expert might be brought forward. If you don't have any knowledge and the case is a complex case, you might give them 24 hours to uh, have an opportunity because the expert may bring some accompanying documents. And so it just depends on whether or not it's going to be an expert, whether the expert is written or published. Uh, there, there are a number of factors that will be taken into consideration, but you probably wouldn't give more than 24 hours because you've got a jury that you have to consider. Uh, you typically would have to perhaps put the trial on hold unless you can go forward with other witnesses. So about 24 hours. Okay, now, if you're the one that's resisting the use of this expert, how do you, is it possible to communicate to the jury why they've been put in on hold for 24 hours? Uh, it seems to me like that would make a jury pretty mad if, if, if I called a witness the other side says, never heard of this person before. Uh, judge rules that the witness can testify on the wit and the jury just has to go on hold for 24 hours. But uh, it, it also would be terribly unfair uh, in some instances for one to have to depose an expert <laughs> without any notice and just to go straight into cross-examining them. Okay, so once you get past Rule 16, then you get into the uh, Uniform Superior Court rules. And those are the ones we normally see, starting with Rule 7, uh, 7.1, which sort of repeats Rule 16 in some ways. It goes through the, the things that the court can do in a pretrial conference. And then it also references, it says, subject to Rule 17. Does anybody know what Rule 17 is? Rule 17 relates to uh, leave of absences and conflicts. So, Basically, the, it says the court can publish a calendar that the parties have to show up and do a pretrial conference, and that uh, subject to Rule 17, the court will then hold these pretrial conferences at which uh, the parties will go over uh, the pretrial order. And typically, you can either bring you either bring your pretrial order to the conference, which of course means who is totally cold on the pretrial order in that instance. Who? If you bring it, if each of the parties brings their part, who's not going to know what it is? The judge. The judge, yeah, okay. And then if you, but the judges may require you to submit it in advance, which seems to me to make a lot more sense if you're going to get logical rulings out of the judge. Judges are smart, but maybe not all that smart if it's a complex case and there's a whole lot of consideration. Sorry, Michael. No uh, offense. <laughs> okay. Uh, but if you don't show up, for your pretrial conference, what can happen to you or to your client? Case can be dismissed. Case can be dismissed. In the worst case, uh, it could, let's assume you're the plaintiff, you really want to get to trial and you don't show for the pretrial conference. If you don't get dismissed, what's likely to happen? Postpone. Postpone, put onto the next trial calendar, uh, which make people very unhappy, particularly your client, if they're looking for money. Um, it happens that, that lawyers, one party or another, won't show up for the pretrial conference. It's not likely that there will be a dismissal, uh, but uh, certain decisions may be made to the detriment of your client <laughs> in your absence. Uh, how often is the plaintiff, who you would think would want to get to trial, the one that asks for a continuance? That's what I would like to know. It depends on the dollar amount involved in the case. Uh, typically speaking, if there has been a lot of money uh, spent with respect to the preparation of the case, plaintiffs are usually prepared to move forward so are the defendants. So it depends because both sides have probably put in a lot of time, preparation, money. Uh, typically, or it's not surprising that if it's a lower dollar amount, uh, one or both of the parties may uh, move to postpone the case. Uh, for whatever reason, they may not be prepared, but that's not unusual. But a lot of times, it just depends on the dollar amount. So, strangely, as we discussed last time, what drives a lot of decisions in litigation? Money. Money. Uh, <laughs> Money. Okay. Uh, 
So the court calls the pretrial conference and what sort of information are you going to need to have uh, in your uh, pretrial order? First of all, what would you do? You'd read the rules and rule what? We already mentioned it. It has the pretrial order in it. Seven. Seven. Uh, seven point, yes, seven. Seven point two is the specific one that has a form pretrial order and the, the rule says that the order you prepare should substantially follow the form of Rule 7.2, and of course a judge can ask for anything different they want uh, other than Rule 7.2. And Rule 7.2's proposed pretrial order has segments in it that might not apply at all to your case, such as segments relating to divorce cases. If you don't have a divorce case, they're irrelevant. Okay. Uh, so, uh, should you, when you show up with your pretrial order and you want to go to trial, what should you be prepared to tell the court that you're ready to do? Present your case. Present the case, try the case. And this comes specifically to mind because uh, Judge Grubbs, who just got appointed the Chief Judge of the Superior Court of Cobb County, said in an article the one thing that she that drives her crazy, one of the things that drives her crazy is that if people show up and they're not ready, uh, they, ought to sh they ought to show up and be ready for trial unless there's some good reason. Okay, I uh, read that in the newspaper, so I think that's fair, fair game for the video. Uh, okay, so there's name, rank, and serial number information. Uh, oh, actually, who should come to this pretrial conference? Your client. Well, typically a client doesn't come. Typically the, order, the, the judge just orders the lawyers to come. We need the lead attorney. Oh, the lead attorney, the one that's going to do what with the case? Try it. Exactly. The one that's going to try the case. Uh, and that's for so many different reasons. One, a lot of deals can be made during the pretrial conference that if, if you send a, somebody that's not going to be trying the case, deals may be made that the person that is going to try the case is not happy at all about. Secondly, the rule actually says the person who's going to try the case has to come. And so there are very few excuses to that. There is the possibility of the authorization upon leave of court to send an alternative person to attend the pretrial conference. But uh, otherwise, it ha has to be the person who's going to try the case. And so the, the pretrial order has blanks for name and address, et cetera, contact information of the, of the lawyers that are going to try the case. Okay, there's a question in the pretrial order about, uh, let's just uh, read it. It says, the jury will be qualified as to the relationship with the following. What the heck does that mean? What kind of qualification do the parties get to do of a jury? Anybody with a financial interest. Okay, people that have financial interest in the outcome of the case. Related. Relatives. Are they related? Could, yeah, it could be close relatives, uh, somebody that uh, would call, somebody maybe close enough that would cause a jury uh, to be biased in favor of one party or another, but it's not going to include all that many relatives. How broad are relatives? First cousins. <laughs> is that a guess? <laughs> I actually don't think so. I think that is the rule, isn't it? Does anybody know what the rule is? I don't know the specific rule. had lawyers in court, they would explore relatives um, in terms of cousins or, or marital relations, things, blood relatives, things like that. At least people that live within the county, I presume, or <laughs> within the vicinity. Uh, and it also may depend on the stature of the person, but uh, I, I think that on the whole, courts are pretty restrictive. Certainly they don't hold that uh, a juror is unqualified if you put somebody who's just tenuously connected to the case and the juror says, I know who that person is, you know, put down, you know, a Barack Obama or something. <laughs> not not going to work. Uh, but should you put down your, if you're a defendant <coughs> and you're insured by an insurance company, should you put down your insurance company's name? <laughs> Must you put down your insurance company's name? I think they actually asked you. 
Cemetery. I don't think they specifically ask it in this form, but, but must you put it down? And if so, what does that tell the jury? More money. Or should you list a whole bunch of insurance companies? <laughs> <laughs> That's not good either. Anybody uh, uh, have a feeling on whether you, sh you must list the insurance company? You must. Okay, I think you must. As Ford Motor Company is now realizing. <laughs> and uh, and uh, you and anybody else, I guess, to be directly impacted by the financial outcome of the case. And what's the purpose of this is to find so that jurors, when asked under oath, do you have any relationship with these people, they can disqualify themselves if they are too closely related or to have financial interests with. Uh, the parties that they're being qualified as to. What do you do if, if the insurance company has declined coverage? Do you still list the insurance company? I think you have to still have to list it even if they are denying coverage. There's still obviously the relationship that's there and the distinct possibility that the, the fact that they may be denying coverage don't mean, doesn't mean that they will win you know, or prevail in the end. So I, I think you still are obligated to now that's actually that's a good question. Uh, Can the jury be in, informed that they have denied coverage? I'm not sure about that. I, I'm not sure that that's appropriate. I mean, denial of coverage is the same thing as no coverage until there is coverage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't, uh, as far as the practical issue goes, uh, I mean, do you have to list your workers' comp policy if you have a if you have a uh, construction defect claim? I don't think so. So I, I suppose it depends if there's a co-pending lawsuit, but that would certainly be something, an issue to discuss at the pretrial conference. And if you're the defendant, you don't, you would really rather not have the jury thinking you're covered by insurance. Uh, hey, Henry, uh, last time I got called to jury duty in Fulton, the jury clerk, before we even got into a courtroom, was asking people whether they were insured with Allstate or such and such insurance company. I was wondering if that was a way of trying to cut people out. Michael, do you know it, about it, that? It, it was, it, you know, depending on the case. Now, I, I'm not, well, that's not something that I was aware of. <laughs> <laughs> but, but some judges may very well, first of all, I think Fulton County has changed things. I think they've consolidated uh, their jury pools now so that there's one for both state and, and, and superior courts. But uh, some judges may actually authorize uh, the clerk to start asking preliminary questions. I had a case where, uh, whereby it took us three months to actually pick the jury because it was a high profile case. And clearly we had um, a significant questionnaire that went out to, I think we had a jury pool of approximately, maybe 2,000 potential prospective jurors. And so we were qualifying them in a totally different way than was the norm. So that, that, that may not be unusual. So there, well, there are a lot of questions that might be asked in voir dire that are different from this qualification question. That's but this correct. qualification question is supposed to weed out, I guess, the most of the least likely jurors to be impartial. Correct. Uh, okay. Uh, so, with respect to stipulations, admissions, etc., uh, those need to be thought about significantly in advance of. Both what, what you put in the pretrial conference and in advance of your pretrial conference itself, because the judge may have a who at the pretrial conference. Might have a clerk or a stenographer. And whose interest is it in to whittle down the trial to as small as possible? Straightforward and simple as possible. Well, it depends. It depends on whether you want to get a lot of extra evidence in on some topic that uh, the other side may not want. Judge certainly would love to have short, easy, non-appealable trials, right? What's the best thing for a judge as far as uh, eliminating issues? You can get agreement of counsel for the party on things, acquiescence or agreement then that puts a cap on a whole lot of appellate issues that otherwise might be subject to being raised. So the judges, as we talked about in summary judgment hearing, judges like to, may ask concessions from the lawyers on the summary judgment hearing to try to 
whittle down the, the issues, eliminate appealable issues, or they may try to do that at a pretrial conference also. Uh, and then also you can inadvertently, especially with poor drafting, you can make admissions or admissions in, in judicia that may, you know, there may be an objection at trial. Uh, Your Honor, there's no need for any testimony on that. It's been admitted. And if you didn't draft your pretrial order carefully, you might be really upset if you put something in, you failed to put the word not <laughs> in front of a word or something of that nature. And uh, chances are it's gonna stick if it's in the pretrial order. Uh, okay, uh, amount of time for trial. Uh, what should you propose if you've got a, a trial, it's gonna be a jury trial, and you've got, uh, five or six witnesses on your side and five or six witnesses on the other side. How, how are you going to know how long that's going to take? It depends on a lot of different contingencies. One witness could testify for the entire day, so the complexity of the case dictates how long the trial is going to be, not just how many witnesses. All right. And, uh, what, do you, what could you find out in advance before you fill in that blank from the court? How long is the calendar? Well, yeah, how, how long is the, I don't know exactly what you mean by how long is the calendar, but uh, what do you mean by that? Well, when I would conduct trials, I would typically ask the lawyers, how, how much time do you need for this particular case? My trial calendar is going to go for two months. You know, I've got 20 cases or lined up. How much time do you need? And then I would tell them, okay, this is how much time I'm going to give you based on what the lawyers have discussed relevant to this case. Okay, so but what that's all driven by, the number of days of trial depends in part upon what? How much time you spend per day in trial. If you have a judge that comes in at 10, takes a brunch at, uh, uh, a brunch. <laughs> a brunch at 11, 15, and then starts again at one and ends at four, uh, that's a big difference from one that starts at eight and goes till noon, and then starts at one and goes till six. And some work on Saturdays. Yes, and so uh, one thing you're gonna wanna know is, if you, something you should be able to find out from the law, law clerk or staff attorney is, how long does this judge run his or her trials each day. How many jury breaks do they give, et cetera? Because right, as uh, Deborah said, you might have one witness that would take an entire day if you had a lot of breaks, and it might only take a morning if you don't have very many breaks. Uh, conservative or liberal in putting down the amount of tri trial time it will take? Liberal. liberal. And why is that? Leave yourself some space. Yeah, because who's likely going to want to cut down whatever you put in there? The defendant. The judge. The judge. The judge. <laughs> yeah, so, and uh, I've never had a case to take less time than I thought it would because inevitably you can get, if you get somebody up there on the stand who just starts throwing out a whole bunch of gibberish that you have to undo using cross-examination, that can dramatically increase, you know, somebody you didn't anticipate they would come in and testify about this at all. You might have to bring two or three witnesses to counteract what this one witness says that's just completely fanciful. This whole uh, discussion is about jury trials as opposed to bench trials. Because if you've got a bench trial and the judge asks you how much time you need, you need to find out if the judge is simply going to uh, presumably just read deposition testimony. No one's going to sit there and read it for him. Mm -hmm. um, and just bench trials in general take a lot less time. So I'm assuming this is about jury trials. Uh, Yes, principally, but yes, also judge trials. Because some judge, I mean, uh, on the flip side, I had a judge, well, I've had judges, uh, who will just let, they'll say, oh, this is like an arbitration. I'm going to let in all the evidence. I'm not going to preclude any, I'll, I'll just sort out the hearsay from the, the good from the bad, et cetera. I want to go ahead and hear everything. Well, obviously that can dramatically increase the amount of time of testimony if they just allow the people to say anything they want to say. And then you pray if you're the one that's hearing all this hearsay, and it's not your hearsay, that they'll actually cut it all back out. You just have to keep making objections. And the judge keeps saying, well, I just want to hear it. I want to hear it. Uh, so, I mean, it's, unfortunately, it's almost very judge-specific, even if it's a bench trial. But 
the, the issue of reading depositions, which we'll take up in a minute, makes a huge difference if it's a judge who will, especially if you've got small designated portions of a deposition. And then you hope the judge actually does what the judge says he or she will do, which is actually read the testimony. Uh, okay, so we talked about last time about uh, getting your documents ready and rule uh, 7.2 subparagraph 14 says, uh, the following is a list of all documentary and physical evidence that will be tendered at trial by the plaintiff or defendant. Unless noted, the parties have stipulated as to the authentic authenticity of the documents listed in the exhibits listed may be admitted without further proof of authenticity. Exhibits shall be marked by counsel prior to the trial so as not to lay the trial before a jury. Uh, so at a minimum, in your pretrial order, you're going to have to list the documents which are used to prove what? Your case. All right. Because it says tendered at trial, right? So anything you're planning on tendering, either for your defense or for your, case, your plaintiff's case, has to be listed. And this particular pretrial order uh, requires you to, uh, only requires you to list them it doesn't require, in many the way many courts are now, that you mark them and share them with the other side before you even do the pretrial order. If you have to do that, you have to back up your whole planning significantly in order to get your act completely together so that you can share the documents with the other side. And why would you need to see the documents on, that the other side intends to uh, list on its pretrial order? Yeah, to determine whether you want to object to authenticity or not. What if there's all of a sudden a document in there that's like a fax to some unknown fax number and it has things scribbled on it that the documents that were produced in discovery don't have or something of that nature? You know, do you want to be in the situation of defaulting into agreeing to the authenticity of the document when in fact you would have the right to cross examine whoever it was that? put that information on there. Um, and it, Now this will shorten the trial if you don't have, have to have witnesses come in to testify regarding the authenticity of documents. But in, while in shortening the trial, what also could it lead to? I would say less reliability as to the truth. Um, you know, just because there's a document that looks like a business record, for instance, that doesn't mean it is a business record. It could be a fabricated business record. Some of y'all that have been involved with fraud cases, you know, you, it's not all that often that there are two sets of corporate ledgers. One is the real one and one is the fake one. Just because it looks like a corporate ledger and it's attached to a pretrial order doesn't mean it's the corporate ledger that actually shows the finances of the business. So. Hopefully that will be determined during discovery, but it's something you need to be very careful about before you agree. And I've certainly seen pretrial orders that list, let's say, five pages of documents and then 100 pages of objections to the authenticity of those documents or some of the documents. Henry, I think the judges frequently also ask the parties to dedupe exhibits. So in other words, if Mickey's going to enter an exhibit and I was going to enter the same exhibit, then we agree that it will be entered one time and used for both sides. And would it be labeled plaintiff or defendant? Well, I don't have the answer to that question. It's interesting. Um, or neither. You can have common exhibits. In which case trial it would be exhibit. labeled it's exhibit. It's a trial exhibit. Yes. Yeah, that's uh, right. Which, to me, if I'm, if I'm on one side, I'm going to want it to be a neutrally named document if I'm going to be sharing that with the other side. Right. Uh, what if you had uh, a document that had numerous permutations? Do you just list it once, like contract between these parties? Or do you have to list every single permutation of the document? It's been my experience with documents different in any respect, even if it's the same document you have to enter each, each version. Yes, I mean, you would definitely want to do that because you're going to want to tender each, each one of them, right? Or at least cross-examination. It's cross-examine on each one. I had one case where there was a single line agreement, three signature lines and a notary. 
The first version of the document had a signature in the notary. The second document had folds in it like a letter. It had another, another line typed in, exact same appearing typewriter, an additional signature, and then a final version with three signatures on it with an edit, one more line on it. So uh, obviously you have to have all three versions to try to figure out what, the, and then nobody could remember when, when they signed the document or what was on there at the time they signed it. So you have to do uh, lots of cross-examination on something like that. Okay. Uh, so what's the purpose of all this pre-marking, pre-labeling, pre-authenticity? Speed and efficiency. Speed and efficiency before whom? The jury. The jury. Jury get bored to death. If you're each time labeling the document, having the clerk label the document, may I approach the witness, ask them, have you seen this document before and all that. In fact, we talked about last time, where are, these days, where are documents often seen by the jury as opposed to in their hands? Excuse me? On the screen. On the screen. Sometimes with somebody making uh, highlights and circles and all that, using an Elmo or uh, something of that nature. Okay. Uh, can all this be done at the last minute? <laughs> who do you want to be? Uh, who do you want to be working with the uh, five days leading up to trial, rather than listing documents in a pretrial order? Witnesses. 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 Uh, and there's total. You can't be doing concentrating on the details of documents at the same time you're trying to coordinate people coming in and preparing, preparing for testimony, etc. So. A lot of this work should be done way in advance. Okay, uh, issues for determination by the jury. Uh, Before you leave documents, yes. in, in my experience, the two biggest problems in doing pretrial orders on documents are the extent to which you have to identify documents that you expect to use in rebuttal, which is dealt with in the federal rules. I can't recall whether it's mentioned in the state rules. And even more so, what do you do with demonstrative exhibits? Do those have to be identified? And if identified, let's assume that do demonstrative exhibits have to be pre-cleared by the judge and by the other, other side? Well, if uh, you have to identify them, presumably you would exchange them, and then if the other side has an objection, you would mm -hmm. deal with it. But the whole issue of what is a demonstrative exhibit and to what extent it has to be identified, um, and every judge, I guess, has a dad in that respect, was before Judge Viney, uh, where... Um, I had an expert who had prepared a chart, and the other side objected to the use of the chart because it was not identified in the exhibit list. And Vining upheld the objection because it was pre-prepared, but allowed the expert to hand draw the exact same chart in front of the jury. So instead of having a nice, clean chart, the expert had to do one on you know, an easel board, but that's the compromise that Vining ruled because he wasn't sure what to do, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. And so he, he split the baby saying, you can't use the demonstrative exhibit that you had pre-prepared, your expert can just draw it in front of the jury. And which was more effective, do you think? Well, who knows, I mean, we did okay in the trial, but it would have been nicer to use the prepared right, exhibit. Right. And but but I mean, every case I've ever had, every pre-trial order I have ever done, those same two issues come yeah. up. That's, that's very, very important. I had one similar where I had a demonstrative exhibit and uh, the judge said, you know, you, basically until all the testimony had come in from all the witnesses, we couldn't use it for any purpose. And same thing with timelines. In other words, nothing is actually on a timeline until somebody has testified about what's on the timeline. Uh, now, some trial graphics people will have these things where you pull off covers one step at a time, and that might be the most effective way to do it if you're going to use a, a hardboard as opposed to a progressive PowerPoint or something. Nikki, were you proposing but, your demonstrative go back to the jury? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. But, but it, it, we didn't even reach that issue. It was just a question whether the jury could see it. I would always suggest pre-clearing it. Uh, and With the a, reason is because the demonstrative evidence is it's so powerful. It's so powerful, right. And, uh, and that's why you don't want to pre-clear it with the other side. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you're right. But, 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 but what tends to happen is I would always say to the lawyers, I can't make a decision about your demonstrative evidence unless I know what the evidence is and unless and until the evidence comes in that's a prelude to it in some way, shape, or form. Yeah, but I'm posing the, the procedural issue. 
that if you didn't list the demonstrative exhibit on your exhibit list, are you dead in the water from the get-go? No, I would not necessarily completely rule it out. I would have to hear the arguments from the lawyers and listen to the lawyers tell me well, what evidence uh, has preceded this such that uh, this is appropriate to bring before the jurors. That's the way I would do it. I, you know, but different judges are different. I will tell you that there are some judges who will absolutely say, you didn't pre-clear it with me, I'm not going to allow it in. Um, but I, I wouldn't say that it would be dead in the water based mm -hmm. on that. Well, the, you know, if both sides are kind of equal on what they intend to do, the easiest way is to have an agreement with opposing counsel as to what you're going to do with demonstrative exhibits. Mm -hmm. But once you raise that issue, if you're the one using the demonstrative exhibits and the other side is not, they're going to want the law. You, you've tipped your hand, and, right. and uh, you know you're you're kind of. And some demonstrative exhibits could cost hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of dollars to <laughs> prepare, such as a uh, pl uh, a plant and showing how the plant operates or something like that, an animation. Uh, so obviously it'd be terrible. Another thing I found is if you have a, a timeline that has maybe a hundred entries in, in, in it that one witness has to can, uh, can cover, how can that one person keep track of all those different entries without anything to go by, you know, on a day-by-day -day basis? That, uh, that's where a demonstrative timeline or whatever would be very, very helpful <laughs> to to work with the witness. Yeah, a lot of demonstratives aren't finished until after the pretrial order is entered. I mean, if you could be working up to the day before trial, get your demonstratives ready. So, you know, they couldn't be listed in the pretrial order. So, what would you then put in your pretrial order? Reserve the right. Reserve the right to identify demonstrative aids and to, to ferret out with the judge whether they're going to be used or not. Uh, that's a big issue. issue. If the other side doesn't object, but if the other side says no, <laughs> you know, if you've got some exhibits, I want, you know, I want you to identify them now. Well, hey, what about the thing about uh, rebuttal? Is rebuttal the same as cross-examination, or you're actually putting in additional no, rebuttal new evidence? To me, other rebuttal is different testimony. from cross-examination. So you're putting in new additional evidence other than cross-examination. Right. In other words, you're putting well, in Like documents. the federal rule says, you've got to identify all exhibits you intend to use, including those that you reasonably anticipate might be needed on rebuttal. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I don't recall there's that same language in state. Uh, this, this language says uh, that will be tendered at trial, okay. which That's even that would include mm -hmm. rebuttal uh, yeah. documents. Again, you better be safe rather than sorry, because you can't afford not to be able to use right. the exhibit. So I would suggest you get clarification, at least with the other side, if not from the court. And if you get clarification from the other side, you better get it in writing. Of course. Because otherwise, <laughs> otherwise their, their, their ideas may change uh, when they find out what you have as a rebuttal evidence. Uh, but the point of the matter is that Mickey's really making is this gets, this is uncertainty up until the very day, at the very moment of trial. When you try to do something, you might get uh, your knees cut off. If you identify everything, you might uh, get everything into evidence real easily, but then the other side will be completely prepared to address anything that you, you put up, and it sort of gives them a heads up. Okay, uh, any more on documents? We can always circle back around for a whole nother Quiggins kernels just on well, then documents. There's, there's that catch all most people put in the pretrial order. If one doesn't put it in at first, you'll put it in when you see the other side do it. All exhibits used with any witness in any deposition in this matter. You know, generic. Yeah. The way they've covered, they've covered everything that's come out in, in discovery. And, uh, but I don't know how the judges feel about that. Um, well, it wouldn't be a separately identified uh, mm -hmm. and labeled document. Right. It'd be labeled. It'd be labeled on a deposition, I guess. Uh, and then I would think that to some degree it depends upon the complexity of the case. But when the other side has had an opportunity to see the document at some point, I never viewed it as a surprise. Uh, but, but it depends on the judges. And there's a lot of discretion in that area. Okay, issues for determination by the jury. Um, what ought to be among those issues? If you're the plaintiff. Damages. Liability and damages. Liability and damages. That related issues, right? And if, and you would need to do it for each 
each uh, put down the issues for each account you're trying to uh, succeed on. Similarly, in the defense, you want to have uh, issues, make sure you list the determinations the jury had. And that with respect to the Tort Reform Act, for instance, they would need to determine what? If you had numerous tort feasors. How do you assess liability of the Yes. Allocation. Allocation, that's the So, the, obviously, one reason for this is to make you think through your entire case and figure out and for the, to give a heads up to the judge of what issues have to be determined, which in turn leads into whether there's any special authorities you need to cite for any of these issues. Use of demonstrative exhibits, uh, listing of documents for rebuttal, uh, any special uh, authority for the particular type of negligence or claim that you have uh, for defense. Uh, and so that needs to be pretty thorough and thought about in advance. Uh, okay, type and measure of damages. So the types of damages could be all sorts of different initial types of direct damages or you could have punitive damages, or you could have uh, wounded feelings damages, uh, emotional distress, special damages, etc. You need to list all those. And then with respect to measure of damages, you need to have your law all prepared as to what the measure of damages for each type of claim you have is. Uh, I had a case where the, it was an issue of conversion, and the question was, whether the measure of damages was the value of the object when it was converted, or whether it was the, the value of the, dot, the uh, item after it had been created into something else much more valuable. Uh, for instance, the, the typical example is timber. Is it the raw tree value, or is it the lumber value? Uh, and so you need to get, that can make a multifold difference in your damages. You need to get all that worked out in advance. Uh, okay, uh, and that could be actually the crux of the entire case is if you have one measure of damages it might not be worth going to trial, if you have another measure of damages it might be worth everything. Uh, okay, so request for charge covered in paragraph 16 of the pretrial order. Uh, is there another rule that says what you have to do with requests for charge? Do you even know what those are? Those are what charges? The jury, jury charges. Okay. Uh, is there another Uniform Superior Court rule that is incorporated in Rule 7.2 that uh, says what you're supposed to do? There is, of course. <laughs> uh, it's Rule 10.3. And Rule 10.3 says uh, requests and exceptions to charge. All requests to charge shall be numbered consecutively on separate sheets of paper and submitted to the court in duplicate by counsel for all parties at the commencement of the trial, which means you have to show up. You can't do this the last day of evidence, right? You have to do it before you start your trial, unless otherwise provided by the pretrial order. Provided, however, that additional requests may be submitted to cover unanticipated points which arise thereafter. So, for instance, if you got an admission uh, on cross-examination, you might be able to put in an additional charge to address that. Now, one thing that always comes up in my cases is, do you try to do you use the pattern jury charges by the Council of Superior Court Judges, or do you use, try to draft a specially tailored jury charges that go directly to the facts of the case and mention the name of the parties? as opposed to plaintiff and defendant, plaintiff and defendant, et cetera. Uh, what would be best as far as helping the jury understand the law? Any thoughts on that? Tailored or untailored? In my experience, perhaps a combination of the two. Uh, there are some, you know, typically speaking, the tailored charges are probably, you, you want to make certain that your charges are tailored specifically to your case. Uh, but you also want to be sure there are some general charges that are sort of catch-all so that if by chance you miss something, there is a general charge there that will in some way, shape, or form um, be persuasive for your case. So perhaps um, some combination of the two. 
What's the safest thing for a judge to use? To use the pattern jury charges or to use tailored jury charges? Pattern. Well, pattern. pattern. Okay. Uh, who researches and updates the pattern jury charges? No one. Nobody. <laughs> so, what does that tell you about the pattern jury charges? They're old. <laughs> and you better do what before you propose them as some your own? Are, some of them are wrong. Yeah. yeah, so once you propose, once you give the jury charges to the court, are they the courts or are they yours? Even if they're the pattern, if they're the pattern jury charges, are they the court's jury charges or are they your jury charges? They're, you're, you're, they're yours. So if you submit on behalf of your client saying, I want the jury charge this way, and even if it's a pattern jury charge and it's wrong, then the burden of that uh, wrongness may come upon your client either at trial or on appeal. Uh, I think there was one on the admissibility of net worth evidence in emotional distress cases that was in there for, uh, what, 16 years without anybody ever changing it after the statute had changed. And so you can imagine what chaos that caused. I think there were trial after trial after trial that had the wrong jury charges given. Uh, and they could change at any time. And frankly, I think jury charges are unbelievably complicated for the jurors anyway. And if they don't have any mentions of names or parties or who did what to whom and all that, it seems to me like they're uh, just unbelievably confusing. Now, do you want to find out in advance before you draft your tailored jury charges what the judge is going to allow? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, you do because it's very, very time consuming to properly draft impeccable, non-reversible jury charges that are tailored. And if sh you show up to court and the court just says, oh, that's the fraud jury charge, I'm just going to give the pattern, I'm just going to give the pattern, I'm just going to give the pattern, then uh, you've wasted all that time and money and there's nothing to be, as far as I know, you could just object to the judge giving the pattern jury charge, but I don't think you're ever going to get it reversed unless the jury charge is actually wrong. Is that your experience? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, which to me, you're talking about two different kinds of tailoring: taking a pattern jury charge and just replacing plaintiff and defendant with the actual names. You know, I, I would be surprised if very many judges had a problem with that. When I think of tailored you know, jury charges, they go way beyond that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the judge would have to determine whether you, all you did was change the names, mm -hmm. which the judge might not be willing to do. Certainly, have seen that. Uh, in other words, uh, well, somebody's going to have to compare the apples to oranges, your, yours with the names in versus what, whatever was in there. Do uh, you have to tell the judge? Well, I think the best way to get it? your charge accepted is to take the pattern charge, redline the changes that you propose so the judge can see all you're literally doing is changing plaintiff and defendant to the names. Um, and that's, that's the easiest way to sell what you want to do. Uh, or even if you want to make some other changes, if you can just show the court Here's the pattern charge. These are the only changes we want to make. I, I think that's the best way to try and sell it. Okay, so you would, I guess you'd prepare a set of unread line jury charges to turn in. Right. And have an appendix to those that are the red line oh, ones. Yes. That, that makes a lot of sense to me. Now there's some, there are a whole lot of causes of actions, claims, defenses, et cetera, for which there is no pattern jury charge. Yeah. Those have to be tailored, and lots of times the judge didn't know anything about the area of law that you're writing a jury charge for. Yeah. So that was our, that last trial we did. We had, first of all the judge told us before the the day before the jury char the charge conference, these are the charges I'm gonna give. <laughs> Tell me if you want any additional ones. And really didn't give us the option to, to alter the ones that he said he was gonna give. And then we had a, a, a an area of law that had no jury charge, and then it was very difficult to try to figure out what we wanted read to the jury. That wouldn't that we knew was going to go to appeal. That we didn't want, you know, to have a problem with jury charge, be a problem for us on appeal too. Mm -hmm. So if you show up for a pretrial conference <laughs> and well, it may not be, it may actually be the day of trial itself. But well, the jury, what is the judge going to do with your jury charges? They're going to have a charge conference. And it could either be at the beginning or it could be after the, after the evidence has been put in. But 
What's, what, what is likely to happen at a charge conference? Is it a slow, methodical, you have time to go home and sleep on it type situation? Mm -hmm. yeah, it's quick. No, so that's an advantage perhaps of having some pattern jury charges is because you don't have, there's only so much you can do about those. If, 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 if you submit a whole lot of tailored ones and everyone is objected to, then you might have to defend every single charge. And then likewise, if the other side submits a whole bunch of pattern ones, and sometimes my experience has been maybe 30 minutes to go through all the jury charges, even in a complex case. I think it's ridiculous, uh, but that's apparently what that's judges what feel like they should do. Uh, that uh, because that's where the likelihood of some major uh, appealable issue coming up is. You think you'd want to make sure that's uh, very, very well set. So that's that's part of the reason why a lot of judges are prone to give patents. And they will actually, I would actually tell the parties in many instances, I'm going to give this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. And then I would say to them, are there any more that you want to add or do you have any objections to any of the patterns? And I would ask the, the attorneys, but, but typically speaking, you can object to the pattern all you want. They're probably yeah. going to be given. Uh, and I would then allow them to turn in any specific uh, jury charges. And the time that we would spend on the jury charges, the way I did it was, I would actually, at the end of all of the evidence, I would keep the attorneys there, and in some instances, we were there for several hours going through the jury charges just because I recognized that this was important. And I would tell the lawyers, okay, we've got a few hours, let's go through the charges and we need to come back in in the morning. I can delay the jury for a couple hours, but let's, let's have it. Yeah, and, and it's, I, I don't know, I, I think it's, you have to put a lot of time into those also, because that's where, yeah. where a lot of your appeal issues are gonna be, and after a week of a jury trial, you're not thinking as clearly, and you have to be able to be on your, even though it may go for a real short period of time, you got know what you're doing because if you don't preserve your issue for appeal, which may be either the verdict form or jury charges, you could you could lose it. What's interesting though is I've seen so many situations where a senior associate, well this is when uh, in a bigger firm, that either a senior associate or even a middle level associate is given the responsibility to handle the charge conference. When I agree with you 100% that that's one of the most important parts of the trial, um, and, you know, but the lead lawyer is running off to prepare his or her closing argument or whatever right. and delegates the charge conference to one of the underlings and uh, bad things can happen. Mm -hmm. And the, the one thing that another practice pointer I might have is everybody, let's say that the plaintiff submits some fraud charges and the defendant submits alternative ones. You need to have some sort of cross-referencing chart or something that can allow you to get from one to the other real quickly. I've had judges up there reeling off. I'm going to do one, three, and five from the plaintiff, you know, two, four, and six from the defendant, and you're just going like this. You have no idea, and, and then any exceptions, and then and then call the jury in. Yeah. And uh, that's just a terrible, frantic situation where you don't have any output other than saying, Slow down, judge, jumping up and down, saying, slow down, judge, I object to them all. I mean, that's, that's about all you can do. If the judge has gone so fast, you hadn't even had a chance to put your eyeballs on That's exactly what the, the, that tavern case where we were in front of Judge Thrash. Yeah. The last witness testified, got off the stand, the judge excused the jury. He said, we're now going to have the charge conference. I was in charge of the charge conference for the defendant. I went to get my fold, my red well, with all the charge information. The judge was already on the fifth charge before I could get yeah. the red well out of my briefcase. And I don't know what else to do in that situation other than just uh, raising cane. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you know, basically, but unfortunately, if the judge is just talking, are you going to say, you know, be quiet, judge? I need to read the jury charges before I. <laughs> You know, accept with, to them or don't accept to them. And what's really interesting is that a lot of lawyers, because they are emotionally drained at the end of the trial, don't put a lot of thought into the jury charges or they don't put a lot of emphasis on dealing with them. They've already submitted them and they just sort of let it go. And you'd be surprised at how many, how few objections you will get when the judges are just going through them. And the fewer the objections, the faster. <laughs> right. and, and I assume 
as a, as a judge, the assumption is, okay, if there are no objections, everybody must be happy with them, so let's keep going. And, and, and that happens, and I think in, in, not, in large part it's due to the fact that the judge, or at least in my case, I'm concerned about the jurors. They've been here all week, they've been here for two weeks, they really want to go home, they're tired, so let's, let's try to move forward with this. And so after the last witness sits down, there is no break. I say to the lawyers, where are we? Any more witnesses? No, Your Honor. Okay, is there any reason why we can't move forward with the jury charge? No, no breaks. Let's keep going. We've got the jury waiting because this may take a few hours. And uh, we'll, we'll sort of go right through it. And so I look at it as the lawyer's responsibility to call to the attention of the court. Your Honor, we object to this. Here's the reason why. Or, Your Honor, may we take uh, you know, a 15 or a 20 minute recess uh, so that we can get our thoughts together, get our jury charge together. I think it's incumbent upon the lawyer to at least ask and put it on the record. Uh, and, and as a, a practice pointer, a lot of times when, when, when a judge, in my experience, when a judge has waited till the end of the evidence to have the charge conference, <coughs> oftentimes the attorneys have a pile of charges that they want to give them, they just kind of give them to the judge and they go over, but no one does anything further with those charges. And I think you should file them. Just go ahead and file them in the record. So if you do have an appeal, you're not well, going to They should have been submitted to the court on should. the first day of trial. Well, they should, but we've had times where the judge has okay. just said, just bring them to me. And mm -hmm. so if, if, in the, when the judge does that, they got to make record. sure they're part of the record of, yeah. so that you can so it's easier to you uh, say you asked for it, but you didn't get it, or whatever the case may right. be. Or, or, or when you're trying to go through and, and read in the transcript yeah. the charge, and then try to figure out from your objections what you objected to, right. I, I can just see a lot of problems arising if they're not in the record. And when the judge doesn't tell you which charges he or she's going to give, and the first time you hear it is when it comes yeah. out of the judge's yeah. mouth, and you're trying to figure out which charge did he give, which ones didn't he give. I mean, that's, that's yeah. very unfair, I think, really, to lawyers. Yeah, you know, you're talking about when they're actually giving the charges, and there may be a word or two difference between your version and the other well, version. The court hasn't told you in advance yeah, what yeah, charges so. are to be given, so you're trying to figure out which of your charges were given, which of the ones you objected to were given, right. and then, right. you, of course, as soon as the charge, as soon as the jury goes out, you immediately have to interpose your objections. It's just really, really hard. Or, or the judge says, I'm going to give the, stack, the, the pattern jury charge on breach of contract and these damages, or this, 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 and don't know exactly what order they're coming up in, you're going through trying to yeah, find it's, out. It can be a nightmare. Yeah. It's not, I think it's unfair and wrong, but that's the way it is. So we're, we're, going, we're going to conclude on that, <laughs> that, that uh, definitive statement. But uh, perhaps this will help folks out there to be better prepared for trial.